Welcome, Patricia. You're very welcome all the way from Ireland. Where Where are you based at at the moment? Uh, Don, I'm in a border town here, Clonus County, Mullaghan, uh, which borders straddles with Fermanagh. And I'm originally from Tipperary, and I've been here 35 years now, so I'm almost a native. And is there a tradition of Samhain back home uh, in Ireland, or is it all Halloween stuff now? Oh, it's become very commercial, you know, the fake masks, the, the makeup, the, the the old traditional stuff has gone, I suppose. You know, the apple hanging out of the ceiling and it's everybody dressing up in costumes and things like that. But the old traditional festivals, as we knew it as children, uh, don't seem to be um, prominent now at all. You know, we don't hear of it anyway. I don't see any of it. What do you remember from, from uh, younger days? Well, I remember it was a very Catholic Ireland then when it was the season of all saints and all souls. And a certain dignity was preserved, I suppose, or uh, permeated for the past relations. Masses were held, all of that. But then we played games like us uh, in the, uh, the, the, the traditional feast was um, nuts and fruit and barn brack. And we hung an apple out of the ceiling with a piece of twine or cord and spun it. And wherever the apple, we tried to catch it under our shoulder and take a bite. And we dived in basins of water for sixpences or threepenny bits, maybe at that time. And simple games with simple people, with simple expectations out of life. But that is all gone now, of course, in favour of the commercial stuff you know you are someone who's very interested in ghosts always has been tell us a little about your own history with ghosts and your own fascination well i suppose uh, i was reared in very rural tipperary on the banks of the shannon in a little village near a little village called pecan made famous famous by i suppose shane mcgowan of the pokes he was it reared there, and Charlie Sheen and his father, they would have been reared locally too before they emigrated to the United States. But the little stretch of road I lived on was about a mile long between one crossroads and another, and it was reputed to be the most haunted road in Ireland. And I did some research before the famine, the Great Famine, the Great Hunger in Ireland in 1845 to 47, some... 300 people lived on that road and when I was growing up there were only three houses and I always got a sense of when I was very small that you know there was something here other than the earthly stuff and I would feel a, a vibe I suppose that there was something else there from the spirit world be it from the famine or former days uh, but definitely there was uh, a presence and um, I think I was about six when I had my first sighting and it was just uh, I came running into the house and I said to my mother I met a monk or a person that I described as was dressed like a monk and of course I got reprimanded for that but I, I saw him walking along in front of me and he, as I was coming to our gateway uh, he turned around and looked at me with the most ghastly expression and disappeared in front of my eyes but I told my mother I saw him then various other little things and then other people saw different apparitions on the road there was a lady seen like in very very bedraggled looking circumstances like a lady emaciated uh, during probably what was the Great Famine here. Uh, she was seen not far from where we lived on, by numerous people who were not under the influence of alcohol at the time. We are like our alcohol, but these ones would have been, you know, pioneers at the time. In other words, they didn't touch alcohol. So, yeah, uh, I had a huge fascination. My father was killed when I was seven. And... I remember about a month after he died, I was cycling a little bicycle into Nina, was our local town, with my mother and a friend of hers. And it was dusk as we were coming home. And I saw the two ladies, my mum and her friend, ahead of us on two bikes. 
And I said, they're going to run into my father. He's walking towards us. And he was walking towards me and I was on a smaller bicycle. And he just looked and smiled at me. And I said, I rolled up at the two letters. I said, Dad, you nearly ran into him on the road. He was there. And they said, that one's not right. You know, if you were different, there was something wrong with you in Ireland, you know. And uh, I, I would have seen things from a very early age in the house we lived in. And then later when I came to live in Monaghan, I worked in Dublin for years and married my husband and we lived out the country here. And on my first day, first month here, uh, I remember he, he was, my husband was a naval officer. He went back to the sea and I was on my own in a strange place out the country. I knew nobody. I couldn't, it was 1979. And it was a beautiful sunny day, I remember, and I was lying out perfecting a tan I had got on honeymoon. And I came into the house with glass of water. And as I came in, I heard the front door ringing. And I said, ah, oh, another neighbour coming to welcome me in the region, which was common at the time. And I went down the steps and my front door was all glass down 14 steps inside the house. And I said, oh, God, this one looks a bit odd. You know, they're very backward looking up this country because I knew nobody at the time. And she was standing sideways at the door. And I'll always remember she had a long red dress and a very stiff white collar on her. And I remember looking at the little shoes, which had little buttons on them. I took in every detail while I was opening all the locks and bolts I had on the door. I was on my own security troubles along the border in Northern Ireland at the time. You had to be very careful. And uh, I opened the chains and all of the door and said, would you like to come in? Which is normal in Ireland. And uh, she didn't answer me, but she walked in. And when I opened, the, there was nobody there. And I, I thought, what? You know, so I ran down. I said, where did she go? And I went down. The, there were 14 steps, oh, sorry, 13 steps up to the hall door. And I ran down, it was three o'clock in the afternoon to see where she had gone. Looked up and down a very rural road and nothing. So uh, I came back into the house and from what had been roasting temperatures, the house was like an ice box. And I remember putting on a sweater on me, even it was so cold. And then after that, she kind of manifested herself in different forms, things moved. Uh, I was on my own at night and I would hear footsteps and yet there wasn't a person in the house. And when my husband would come home from sea, he would see it or hear it, but he wouldn't tell me because he knew I was afraid. And when I had my first baby, then she became very evident. I remember one night, that was 1981, um, I was feeding the baby in the middle of the night, midnight feed. And I had a rocking chair in the, it was a very old house again. I love old houses. And I was on a rocking chair and I was just walking over to it with the baby to sit on it to feed her. But the chair started rocking automatically before I got to it. And I had a big furry rug under it and I could see the indent of feet marks. And uh, subsequently, a few nights of episodes like that I remember getting back into the bed when I put the baby in the cot beside the bed and I remember st standing on a set of ice cold feet. I saw nobody but I stood directly on a set of all I can describe was like ice cold toes or bones and I let a screech turned on the lights of course all of that and kind of I didn't sleep very well there for seven years as we stayed in the house. But I would say in seven years, I got about three nights sleep. And one night I was get... mm, sorry, Donna. After I left the house, the, the house had been vacant for about 10 years before my husband bought it. Locals didn't buy into it, even though there was land with it and there's uh, traditionally a great greed and hunger in Ireland for a bit of land. 
and nobody had put a bid on it. And he was away at sea and didn't know the history of it. So he said, there's a fine house, lovely gardens, lovely land, rare few cattle, part-time farmer and great big house, few things to do, but it'll sit. So he bought it and we moved in. But later I discovered that the bedroom I had chosen to sleep in uh, was occupied by a lady in the 50s, 1950s, and she had died in childbirth in the room that I chose to sleep in. And uh, a neighbour lady showed me her picture later. Uh, when we had left the house, I went back to visit neighbours and people like that. And one night, and she said, I'm going to show you something and see what you make of it. And she pulled out a note. And when I saw the picture of the lady who had died, it was like looking at myself. The lady was almost an identical, different hair colouring, maybe things like that. But visually, she looked like me. And I got an awful fright. And she said, you know, when you moved into that house, even though we knew you were a stranger and all of that, the whole neighborhood was talking how identical you looked to the lady who died. But um, my husband saw her later. I, engaged, I was afraid to stay on my own. So when he was away, I engaged a kind of a live in companion and she came over from London to live with us. And she, too, saw her on numerous occasions. The woman never did any harm to us now, my dad. Uh, indeed, one night, my second daughter, Jessica, she was about two, three, and it was the first night I put her in a bed out of her crib, you know, her first night, and I was asleep uh, about three in the morning, and something was pulling me there, and I thought, what the hell, you know, and it actually pulling me, dragging me out of the bed, across the landing to the room where Jessica had got down under the duvet, and was uh, kind of smothering, I suppose. She was roasting. The perspiration was pouring out of her. And that we had actually to swab her down. Um, the housekeeper was with me at the time and we had to revive her basically. But I truly believe that he came back to warn me that dangerous things were happening, you know. But if not, I wouldn't go back and spend the night in that house.